and um, without further ado I will pass over to Beth. Thank you Beth. Thank you Kate. Um, good afternoon everybody, it's really great to be here, thanks so much for giving up what might, what might be your lunch break right now to uh, listen to me talk about Arts Council Collection. If anybody needs to eat while they're watching I absolutely welcome that. Uh, so I'm just going to share screen now, so just bear with me one second. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, today for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to introduce you to the Arts Council collection and I'm going to start with a bit of history um, because I think it's really interesting to know where the Arts Council collection came about, why it came about, um, what the sort of uh, imperatives and driving forces were at the very beginning. Um, and then I think that really sheds context on um, what we do today and what our sort of aims are today and the function that we play within our arts ecology. Um, and then, so I'm gonna move on from history and then I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our activities, what we do, and then some of our plans for the future as well. So we've got uh, quite a lot happening in the coming years uh, that'd be great to share with you. Um, and I'm gonna put uh, quite a focus on um, how works come into our collection. So um, we are very fortunate in that we have a really active um, acquisitions program. Um, so I wanted to share with you how artists come to be part of the Arts Council collection as well. So I'm going to start with a bit of history. So before there was Arts Council uh, collection, um, and more specifically before there was Arts Council of Great Britain, there was an organisation called CEMA, so Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts. Um, and this was founded uh, around 1939-1940, and it was kind of a, a counterbalance to ENSA. So ENSA was the Entertainments for National Services Association and ENSA was about uh, entertaining uh, the troops. So as a counterbalance to that we had SEMA which was about sort of providing entertainment for um, people within the UK. So um, what uh, SEMA was set up to do was it was like a sort of a small grants giving program. So it, it was given a, a bequest of money and um, it uh, distributed that money around practitioners, so people who worked in theatre, uh, musicians, uh, visual artists, and those um, people went around uh, the country and they took their art form to um, village halls, to churches, um, to communities to encourage people to uh, have an interest or to take part in theatre, music and the arts. Um, this was uh, sort of a programme that was seen to help encourage people to help value the arts generally, but also in a obviously a very difficult period in history to provide people with sort of care and um, and hope as well. So um, SEMA um, sort of they I mean on the right here you can see an image SEMA uh, had this really interesting short documentary which showed um, people going around looking at art attending theatre productions and the image you can see on the right there is a still that I took this was an, an exhibition of paintings which was in a factory um, and these are some people looking at those paintings and you can see the actual painting that they're looking at here which is in our collection by Eve Kirk and so SEMA collected during its time 76 oil paintings and these 76 oil paintings toured around the country to all kinds of places. Um, as you can see, it was, they were quite sort of informal in their respect. So you could, this is not how we would uh, handle a painting today, um, but they were sort of toured around to uh, delight people, to interest people in painting. So they might want to paint themselves. Um, but the focus was very much on artists, on either supporting artists or becoming an artist yourself. Um, so SEMA was seen as being successful, but there was no, there was definitely no guarantee that it would continue. Um, so there was quite a campaign uh, for it to continue. And one of the leading proponents in that campaign um, was Maynard Keynes. Um, some people may have heard of uh, Maynard Keynes. He was an economist, um, uh, predominantly, but a bit of a polymath um, and interested in art um, and part of the Bloomsbury group. 
and um, through Maynard Keynes, he was the first chairman of SEMA, uh, really campaigning uh, for this to carry on, along with other figures. I don't want to present our history as this sort of single narrative. Actually, it was lots of things coming together at the same time in, in different ways. Um, but that led to the establishment of the Arts Council of Great Britain. Um, and the, um, that was established in 1946. So we're, we've got our 75th anniversary this year. Um, and Maynard Keynes saw it be established, but unfortunately uh, died in 1946 as well. So it uh, didn't continue. Um, but some of those early people that took this forward, um, people like Kenneth Clark, um, as the sort of first uh, head of Arts Council of Great Britain and other people were very sort of part of our, our, our founding years really. So once, um, um, I was actually just yesterday reading the first annual report for the Arts Council of Great Britain because I was just sort of quite curious about how it was spoken about and actually the first paragraph of that report says we are going to continue as SEMA was. So there wasn't a lot of uh, change in that first initial period but the Arts Council of Great Britain was set up um, to provide funds for artists to keep on being artists um, and to uh, focus on audiences having um, to be delighted by the arts but also having the um, opportunity to, to participate as well. So in 1946 um, we started with touring exhibitions and um, so we took that first exhibition that SEMA did which was all of paintings and we decided to continue touring exhibitions. So we had this exhibition called Sculpture in the Home and it actually went through four iterations between 1946 and 1959. And as you can see from this photograph here, it was quite an informal exhibition. So we, uh, the exhibition was setting up sort of small areas that looked like domestic interiors. So lots of tables, chairs, there were things like um, uh, a room for a single bed or a room for uh, something else. And we would put uh, small sculptures in them. And the idea was that people could look at that and think, oh, I want to have sculpture in my home as well. So it would lead people to spend their own money and to invest in the arts as well. Um, so here's another one. This was another sort of setup from the exhibition sculpture in the home. Um, so that was another part of um, this program. It recognised that the the there were incredible artists um, around the country, but resources were short, and uh, the ability to keep on making art, as I'm sure is similar in a different way today, but similar still. Um, it was about encouraging investment into the arts so that artists could keep on being practitioners. Um, and that's why we started acquiring artwork as well. So from our very early days, um, we've always purchased, Arts Council Collection has always purchased existing artwork. The idea being that by purchasing existing artwork, it leads artists to have the resources and the means to carry on to make their next artwork. There are some exceptions of that. We have had some commissioning projects at different points, but consistently year on year, what we are doing is purchasing existing works. And that really goes back to our early days. So in those, uh, and I have to admit that we don't know everything about these early days and I'm working on a project at the moment to uncover as much as I can. Um, so we continued to purchase works uh, from 1946 onwards, but it wasn't until uh, 1958 that we established something called our Acquisitions Purchasing Committee. So this is a committee of people that um, don't uh, all work in Arts Council collection, um, but change quite regularly. And they um, purchase, or they make decisions about purchasing for, for the collection. So this could be, um, so what I'm trying to think. So from our very early days, we had um, people, they were usually people that were already in the collection. Um, so for instance, Adrian Heath here, this is an artwork that we have in our collection. And Adrian was involved in helping to purchase other artworks for the collection. Um, and they would be sort of like recommendations that uh, we would go ahead and that model continues today. So every two years, um, we have a committee that changes that consists of an artist, um, a curator, um, somebody uh, working in the arts field, uh, sort of outside of London, 
um, and it can be an academic as well. And they consider all applications to the collection. Um, and these applications are coming directly from artists themselves. So we don't accept applications from dealers. They, they do come directly from the artist. Um, or they bring their own recommendations of people that they think should be in the collection itself. And so every year we're able to purchase uh, different artworks and I, th I believe hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're going to be releasing details of the artworks that we've continued to purchase throughout lockdown, which has been a very uh, a different uh, scenario for us. So the um, so our history is very much tied up with um, closely linked with two big organisations. So we have the Arts Council of Great Britain, which I've sort of traced a little bit of the history of on, on one side. And uh, as you all know, the Arts Council of Great Britain uh, sort of devolved into the Arts Council England, Arts Council of Wales, Arts Council of Scotland in 1994. Um, but Arts Council of Great Britain up until this point, so I'm just going to skip here until 1986, um, ran um, two galleries predominantly. So they ran the Haywood Gallery and they ran uh, the Serpentine Gallery. Um, but in 1986 that devolved a little as well. So the Haywood Gallery then became sort of its own uh, institution managed by uh, South Bank Centre, Serpentine as well. And in that sort of uh, devolution, uh, Arts Council collection stayed with Hayward Gallery. So this is quite a complicated thing that um, I wouldn't expect anyone to know unless you worked uh, within the team. But so I work for South Bank Centre um, and I manage Arts Council England's collection, which is owned by Arts Council England. So it is a slightly complicated um, relationship, but it just means that um, the collection itself is sort of slightly once removed from Arts Council England and stays within the kind of arts ecology at South Bank Centre. Um, so we are a loan collection. Um, so the collection itself is around, well, it's actually just over 8,000 artworks. Um, I did a, a sort of a, a little bit of an add up uh, quite recently. I think we're on about 8,016 artworks at the moment. Um, so compared to other collections, we're actually quite small and we're relatively new, only starting in 1946. Um, and our remit is to collect um, uh, uh, works by artists uh, living and or working in Britain. So our definition of British art is quite wide. The artists themselves might not define as being British, uh, define themselves as being British, but um, we have quite a broad definition. And then we are predominantly a loan collection. So we exist to lend to other venues, but we do have a venue of our own, um, which is Longside Gallery. So I don't, I don't know if anyone has had the opportunity to visit Longside Gallery. This is where we store our sculpture collection. So we have around 800 works of sculpture, which uh, in the space of uh, having an, a collection of 8,000 seems like a smaller proportion, but um, sculpture, uh, the sculpture store is our biggest store. Um, and you can see sort of a, a side of it here. So alongside we have a, an annual programme and this is on the same site as Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So it's on the boundary between Barnsley and Wakefield uh, up in Yorkshire. And we have this um, fantastic exhibition space. And at the moment, um, sort of trying to work around all the current restrictions, we're installing our next exhibition, which is called Breaking the Mould, which opens in April. And Breaking the Mould is an exhibition looking at women in sculpture since 1945 and looking at those gaps and areas where um, female sculptors might not have been supported in the same way as male sculptors. So that exhibition is due to open shortly. So we have this space that we program once a year, but also we inhabit lots of other spaces around the country. I wanted to give you a flavour of some of the works that we collect. Um, our, from a medium point of view, our collecting um, stream is very, very broad. So um, for, uh, I mean, one of the main prerequisites is we're a, a touring collection. So works do on the whole need to be able to move and we need to be able to show them in lots of different spaces. Um, and there are exceptions to that. We do have some works which are fixed works, um, but I think only three. Um, on, so on the whole, we uh, tour works around the country. And these, this is just a, a small sample of some of the works 
which are very famous in our collection for various different reasons. So we have our Francis Bacon painting Head Six on the left there. Um, a really early drawing by Barbara Hepworth um, called Reconstruction from 1947. And a Bridget Riley work, which is a, a really iconic work called Mo Movement in Squares from 1961. Um, but the collection doesn't sort of just collect quite traditional media. We're really open to uh, an incredible span of uh, work. And I wanted to show you just a couple of works we've purchased really recently. And these are sort of kind of picked at random. Um, this Daniela Dean work, uh, Keep Out of Reach of Children, is a mobile that we purchased a few months ago. And I really only put this in because we were installing it yesterday. We were just seeing what the work looks like and um, how we might put it together. Um, so we've got these works here and then um, we collect, uh, we have a really strong collection of video work and some really key early video works um, from the 60s, 70s and 80s. And this is a very recent work we create, uh, collected by Patrick Staff called The Prince of Homburg. Um, I don't know why this spoke to me right now, but this was a work that I was watching yesterday and sort of uh, thinking about it in our current uh, uh, situation. And some of the works we collect, we've been uh, working with a partner at the moment around a show around humour. And um, uh, this work sprang to mind. This is a Jonathan Baldock work called uh, Mass 28. Um, and this work, uh, uh, Jonathan looks at sort of how we reckon, I, I, can't, I won't remember the exact term for this, but how we recognise our face or human characteristics in various different works, but with a sense of humour and lightness and playfulness. So we really do collect work from all medium. Um, I would say that to date, the collection hasn't purchased its first internet based artwork at the moment. That is a medium that we haven't collected. Um, and we are very early in collecting performance works. So we have five performance works in the collection at the moment. Um, four of which are by uh, female artists. And we recently collected works by Taishani, her performance from the um, Turner Prize, as well as really uh, interesting works by uh, Fran Disley. Um, so it, there are ele elements of our collection where we, we feel like we're quite new in collecting and we're still exploring how we're going to care for those works um, predominantly. Um, but all mediums are, are open to us. So once we have this collection of artwork and um, it's sort of what do we do with it now? So I wanted to give you an idea of what our programme looked like looks like. So we lend work um, and this may be uh, one or two works to somebody's exhibition or somebody's theme um, or it may be that we tour a full exhibition. So roughly each year we lend around 1100 to 1200 works. Obviously that, has been that hasn't been the case for the last year but we're about to see a sudden upsurge coming up as, as venues are able to reopen again. Um, and this is the last exhibition that I worked on. Uh, so this uh, exhibition was called Criminal Ornamentation. Yinka Shonabari MB curates the Arts Council collection. Uh, so you can see Yinka there on the left. Um, and on the right, there is the installation as it was at Leicester. So this was an exhibition that toured around the country, opened at the Attenborough Centre in Leicester. It then went on to uh, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. It, went from there to our site in Wakefield that I showed you earlier and then the tour finished at Southampton Art Gallery and this was an exhibition where we invited Yinka in with a really open brief we said to um, him you can uh, you know curate an exhibition along whatever lines you, you're interested in and Yinka was interested in the social and political connotations of pattern and how they've been used in contemporary art um, so you'll see here a number of works from our, our collection, as well as this fantastic wallpaper at the back by Timorous Beasties, a firm in Glasgow, um, which on the uh, sort of outset looks like a quite a, uh, a friendly, familiar um, pattern that you might see in somebody's house. But as you get closer, you quite see quite subversive imagery. Um, there's somebody who's having their bag snatched. Um, there's uh, somebody mugging somebody else. Um, and Yinka was really interested in this idea that pattern on the surface can be very inviting, can be welcoming, can sort of bring you in. And we choose patterns. There's, lot, you know, there's lots of patterns that we have in our day to day life. But that actually might be a number of political and um, social reasons behind those patterns and how they came to be. Um, Yinka's practice particularly 
as you can see behind him uh, on the work there called Lime Painting, uh, looks at um, Dutch wax print, also known as African print, um, and the um, global social political um, history behind that print. And so he wanted to expand that kind of thinking into looking at other contemporary works. So Breaking the Mould is our next exhibition and we are working on further exhibitions for 2022 and beyond. But that's part of what we do. Um, but similarly, as you saw really early on when we had that exhibition in a factory, um, Arts Council Collection really drives lending work outside of the museum and gallery setting. And I just wanted to give you an example of two projects that I've been working on here. Um, since lockdown started, we really wanted to focus on being able to put more art in schools so that when schools were able to go back, um, the environment was um, made stronger, made better, made more creative, I suppose, by the inclusion of having work from a national collection in there, we wanted to show that, you know, we really value our school environments and that to put art in a school environment we see is incredibly important. Um, so on the left here, you have a project that we did with Newlin School, um, which is in Penzance, and they formed their very own Arts Council, uh, which was a group of students who selected eight works from the collection and they hung them in their school. And then because they were their very own arts council, they lent or they were planning to lend those artworks to their local gallery. So um, this was going to be an exhibition called Palace of Culture. Unfortunately, that exhibition hasn't been able to happen in the way that we wanted it to happen. Um, but we've sort of kept those artworks in that school for the time being. And um, we really wanted the students to see them as their artworks. It's their national collection. And um, that was a sort of a really key project for us. And then similarly there on the right, we're about to change around this painting, but th that is a school called Chandos in Birmingham. And they, I gave them a selection of three paintings and they ran an incredible campaign within the school for um, students um, and their parents to choose which painting they would like to have in the school. And um, my screen doesn't quite show it, but I think you can see there that there is a wallpaper behind that school, uh, behind the work. So the students, uh, worked together through all these three paintings and looked at different elements that they liked about them and they put them all together and it became this wallpaper um, and then we did it this was the day of the unveiling so we sort of snuck in we hung the painting that was the winning one and uh, we put sort of a, a sheet over it and we unveiled it to the students it was a really fantastic day it's also the day that i cried twice because i find those projects really emotional but it was a, a really fantastic thing to do so we're lending work not only to gallery and museum settings, but we're also lending it to schools, uh, hospitals. We work with paintings in hospitals. We have around 72 works, I think, at the moment, out and about in hospitals and um, universities. Um, really, we'll lend to any public facing building. We don't lend to private residencies, um, but if the public can go into a space um, for whatever reason, then we'll look to lend a work to that space. Um, and we're not just creating creating exhibitions sort of on our own and touring them around, but we try to work in collaboration with all of our venues. And one particularly um, strong collaborative project that we've been running for a few years now is called the National Partners Programme. So we currently have three partners on this programme. One is First Sight Gallery in Colchester. Uh, one is uh, Newlin Art Gallery and The Exchange. And the other is Sunderland Culture. And over the course of three years, they're working, well, we're working with them and their audiences to curate um, programmes, uh, opportunities, exhibitions, all kinds of things, really, um, using the collection as a starting point and a, as a, a, a place to start conversation. Um, and this is a, a particularly um, interesting exhibition, which oh, I think was last year. Um, it's time is sort of all mushed together into to one lump at the moment. But this was called Tell Me the Stories of All These Things, curated by the Radical Women of Colchester. So it was a, a various a group of women that were selected that came together to choose different works for for the show. So another thing um, which is a really key element of our programme is that we research and we lead research and um, we are looking to expand um, how, how our works are understood to make sure that um, works don't just come into the collection and it's seen as sort of a, a repository or a holding for all these works but actually we're 
um, creating um, more dialogue around them, extending research, looking for new contexts and new relevance. Um, there's two research strands which I'm particularly in, um, involved in, in the moment, at the moment. The first is we're a partner with the Decolonising the Arts Institute based at the University of Arts London um, um, on a programme called um, Decolonising the Co Decolonizing Collections. Um, and this uh, was a project which um, came out of an audit of our collection. So um, they audited our collection along the lines of representation. And it was led by Sonia Boyce, uh, who's also in our, in our collection and was also one of our purchasers in the 80s. Um, and it uh, gave us sort of a, a bedrock of data around uh, who is in our collection, how they came into our collection and who isn't in our collection. And so that data then has led us to continue our research into the Decolonising the Arts Institute um, uh, programme. Another uh, research strand which I'm leading on is um, called the Working Class British Art Network. Um, this is part of the British Art Network managed by Tate. Um, and as part of that, I'm looking into how we create a platform for artists from working class backgrounds um, and lead organisations to um, display works by um, display works and narratives around working class identity. Oh yeah, sorry. And this this is my image for that. This is uh, Sean Edwards' Mailfer, uh, which is a, an artwork in our collection, which uh, looks uh, which Sean filmed around a um, what's the word I'm looking for like a shopping centre in Wales, which was due for demolition through sort of a gentrification project. Um, and it's a really beautiful um, uh, sort of soothing video. And Sean showed this at a recent meeting I held for the Working Class British Art Network with a uh, voiceover that his, uh, his, his mother did for his uh, uh, Venice Biennale project. Um, so if anyone's interested in part, being part of the network, absolutely ask me about that later and I can share details on that. But in all elements of what we do is it's about caring and it's about how we care. Um, and this is something we've been thinking about really closely at the moment. This is a, a bit of a staged photograph of me here doing a condition report on it on one of our Penella Clough paintings. Um, but we're not just thinking about the physical care of artwork. So obviously we are responsible for making sure that our artwork is in uh, sufficient conditions. It's displayed. Um, in a way that's safe to both the artwork and the public. But also we're thinking about how do we care for those narratives? How do we care for, pe for uh, the artworks that are in our collection? And how, um, as a collection, we, we really recognise that the decisions we make are powerful. So who comes into our collection can be a massive boost to somebody's career. Um, it can also be a huge oversight and very damaging to not be broad in our, our approach to how we acquire works. Um, the narratives we tell, who we lend, lend those works to, how they're lent, what research there is around uh, different works. So we're really um, constantly thinking about how we expand our notion of care and how we make sure that in every element of our practice we're sufficiently caring for um, British art as we have it now and the future of British art. So I know I've spoken at you quite, I can see the timer in the top here, that I've spoken at you for uh, about 40 minutes or so. Um, that's sort of a rough overview of uh, the collection. Oh, actually, sorry, my, I was watching the timer at the top. Actually, I've got a few more minutes perhaps um, that I can cover some parts of our project. That's sort of an overview of, of what we're working on, but we're thinking about the future quite a lot at the moment. Um, some of you will have, may have seen that uh, it came out in the news a few weeks ago that we may as a collection be moving to Coventry. So I showed you an image of um, Longside and I'm responsible for managing our uh, London based art store. So at the moment the collection is split over two sites um, but as uh, if any of you work with collections will know uh, every art store seems to be packed to the rafters and we're always looking for more space. Well we've got to the point where we really are too packed in our stores and so we're looking for a really uh, interesting space where we can expand into. And it was released in the news a few weeks ago that um, there's a space in Coventry, which Coventry Council are looking to purchase. And we are hoping to be um, part of that project, but also it's we're at this weird in between limbo stage where um, it's out there in the public, but it's actually not all seen, signed and sorted as yet. 
So we're looking to grow, we're looking to expand, and it may mean that we um, move our sort of uh, London-based operation into um, that more Midlands-based venue. So there's lots of change there. But also uh, in September last year, we had a, a new director start with us, Deborah Smith. And um, as is always exciting, when you have a new director, you have new ideas, a new perspective on what you're doing. And so we're looking at what our programme is going to look like over the coming years. We're going to be experimenting with some new forms, some new ways of looking. And um, we've been thinking about the traditional exhibition format and is it still fit for purpose? Um, over the last year, we've definitely learned that people consume information in different ways and actually the power of being able to um, think about lots of different outlets, lots of different ways that we can reach people um, and accepting the fact that there aren't hard to reach audiences. There's just an arts organisation that's not reaching everybody yet. So we're looking at how we um, look, how we uh, create Arts Council Collection as a space where we can um, be ready to reach out and to um, take what we have and what we, you know, shape our programming around who we want to reach. Okay, so I think if it's okay, I'll leave it there. And if anyone has any questions, I'm really interested to hear them. Um, hopefully I've covered quite a lot of what we do, although I'm, I'm sure I've left out a massive part of our program in some, in some way. Just gonna stop sharing, where are we? Go. Great. Thank you, Beth. That was so interesting. And I think also particularly interesting was um, when you just mentioned at the end there about there not being any hard to reach audiences, just um, arts organisations that haven't reached certain audiences yet. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good way of, of thinking about um, engagement and, and reaching um, audiences. Um, okay, um, Michelle has put um, her hand up. Michelle, do you want to ask your question? Um, it's not so much a question. I just wanted to say thank you. It was a really interesting presentation. But also I attended the Working Class Artist Network group meeting and it was a great meeting. And it just because you mentioned it, it just reminded me and I just wanted to say thank you so much for that. And it, it was really great to be in that space and to hear those discussions. So, sorry it wasn't really related to the presentation, but, um, but yeah, um, it felt like an opportunity to just mention that, so thanks. No, that's fine. Thank you so much. I have to admit, Kate and I were just talking about this before the meeting. I've been absolutely blown away by the response to this. So, um, I mean, I'll just give you a very brief overview of where this network came from. But um, last year, when obviously... Um, you know, it, it was a really difficult time for everybody and it, it's continuing to be a really difficult time. I was really thinking about um, like my position, you know, as, as a curator for a national, a national collection, you're in a real position of power in lots of ways. And I'd really started to think about well, what, like, what, what am I doing with this? Like, what, how am I applying this? You know, what am I doing with the agency that I've got? And I started to think about, um, representation of working class people within Arts Council Collection because we've got some really strong works but we just don't talk about them in the way that I felt was um, appropriate and so I thought well I'm going to use this time I'm going to do some research and what really smacked me in the face was there, there just isn't that you know that it's a massive gap and I was really searching for conversation around contemporary British art and working class identity and it was very piecemeal or it was sort of it was not spoken about really um or it was a bit under the radar or some it would be coded in other kind of codes and um and then i saw that the british art network were uh, offering funding for new research networks and i just um, i'm part of the museum as muck uh, group if anyone else is part of that it's a great group and i just put a bit of a cursory comment on the facebook group saying does anyone think this is a good idea do you think there'll be a call for it and the the response was really enthusiastic so i put together an application um I'm, I'm really pleased that we were successful and then we ran our first event um a few weeks ago and it was really supposed to be sort of an introductory event just to see if 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 there, if there was a demand out there really and, and who would be interested in talking about this and we had 110 people attend this first event um, we had three speakers thinking about working class identity from an intersectional approach um, 
and I've been inundated with emails and people wanting to talk about more but also people really stressing that they found that there's just so little spoken about out there so um I'm about to share hopefully in the next week or so the details of the next event and I'm also thinking about something because these events are quite big there was a lot of people that attended actually what I can do to create um conversate more smaller conversations because it's very difficult to have a conversation in a massive event like that so actually how we can have something which runs alongside which is a bit more discursive I guess um I just notice a couple of comments come up in the chat yeah there are um a couple of um there are a couple of comments in the questions in the comments box there are two that just relate to that working class artist um research network so perhaps we'll just go to those and then we'll come to um tanya's question so chenille just wants to know how they find out about the, the working class research group um mm -hmm. and helen um secondly to that has just asked what the link is to the working class network i'm guessing helen that you mean the link with the arts council collection uh, yes great so first question um, at the moment it's a mailing group um, so I do want to establish a, a website um, and I, I am trying to learn these skills which I just don't have at the moment but um, I do want to have more of an online presence but at the moment it's a mailing list so I will before this before we finish with this event I will put the link to that um, to sign up to that mailing list in the chat um, the link to the working class, uh, the link to Arts Council Collection was um, mainly because I feel that we hold a lot of artworks which very directly speak to working class identity. But when I looked at um, how we speak about them, it's just not there. But equally, um, Arts Council England uh, next year is about to um, make a question to do with class identity compulsory for its N uh, for its. Um, NPO funded organisations so we know that it's out there and into and we know that organisations are now going to think hopefully um, much more carefully about how it's re reaching audiences from different social strata um, so we wanted to get ahead in some ways and I wanted to lead a research which is around art and artists so this group is not necessarily thinking about audiences um, and it's not also thinking uh, specific directly about other um, arts professions. So it's not really thinking about curators from our, our working class backgrounds, um, because we see that we, we wanted to run alongside what Museum as Muck was doing as well. This is specifically about the art and the artists. So the, the content of the artwork, how the artwork is presented, about exhibition practices. Um, I, the really interesting thing is lots of, um, I've been notified of lots of different exhibitions that are coming up over the next couple of years, which um, are thinking about working class identity. So we're, we're thinking about that element. It, the network, in, to a large extent, I, I'd love to do so much with it, but I also didn't want to stretch us so thinly that we weren't actually achieve, we weren't actually adding to the conversation. We were just highlighting a gap. So I did want to make sure that we were adding as well as highlighting a gap. Um, and then the other um, question: How do you decide who or which pieces of art are chosen for the collection? So this is a little bit case by case example, but if I give you sort of a general overview. Um, the, when the acquisitions committee and which I'm not on so this is uh, this is one of those things where lots of curators in other organizations have a very uh, strong say on the work curated uh, chosen for their organization I don't quite have that say because it is a semi-external committee that chooses the artist when it comes to the actual artwork that's there um, then uh, so for instance uh, the committee might identify an artist and say let's say they choose Ryan Gander and we, it, they haven't you know Ryan Gander's on our committees but um, they might say but we're not quite sure which work is most appropriate they then might come to me and the curatorial team and say we're thinking about this artist but as you actually work with the art, artworks and uh, guide um, uh, organizations into showing them or borrowing them which do you think of these artworks is most appropriate for the collection so it's a little bit of a conversation in that respect um, and to Pamela's question as well um, yes uh, artists apply directly to have their work acquired and is there a deadline that's a really good question the um, I know that the acquisitions committee meets four times a year so there probably is a deadline that's associated with that um, I can find that out and let you know I know they've just had their last meeting for this financial year so their new one um, will probably be in a couple of months time um, thanks um, Beth 
And then Helen's just popped in the chat there about a recent TV programme about Welsh art that looked at um, the working class uh, people in art represented in visual works. Um, yeah, I really want to watch that. I saw it was on the other day. Um, I'm uh, living with my parents at the moment and uh, I have to share the TV basically. So um, I'm going to have to watch that another time. But I did notice that Bedwell Williams, um, who's an artist in our collection, a really funny artist in our collection. He's, he's, he also has a practice as a, well, I don't know if he does it now, but he used to have a practice as a, a stand up comedian. Um, and he, I, know, I saw a screenshot which showed that he was on that documentary. So I definitely want to catch up and watch that. It looks really interesting. Um, if anyone is interested in class as well, um, on BBC Scotland, there was a recent three-part programme um, by Darren, oh gosh, as soon as I started to say his name, I've just forgotten his name, um, about working class identity generally. Um, Darren wrote a book called Poverty Safari, um, which is a really, it's quite a short book, but it's a really interesting um, exploration of uh, evolving working class identity, particularly over the last since since new labor probably so particularly in the last sort of 20 years um but darren or oh, i wish i could remember a second i want to say harvey but i don't think that's right um uh, presented this really interesting program looking at the state of um class identity today and the focus is mainly around scottish mcgarvey thank you so much not harvey mcgarvey <laughs> um and yeah looking at uh, contemporary class identity particularly in scotland but um it's really it's a really interesting exploration um class. Great. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Feel free to unmute or do write it in the chat if you would prefer. Yeah. Hel Helen, have you got your hand? Yeah. Up. Go yeah. for it. I um, went to an opening by um, an artist by, called Edgar Martin, a photographer. And he did um, a project on incarceration um, in prisons. And um, what was interesting about his work was how he portrayed um, people in prison, often working class people, and he didn't actually take the voyeuristic view of actually photographing them. He got to know them and then he did representations of their incarcerations with photography and often he had standing people and, and some of his uh, pictures were lovely mm. and I can't remember what his show is called it's something like um, how can you compare an empty vase with incarceration but e Edgar Martin he, he is and yeah it's really nice his work that sounds fascinating I can't remember whether it was at Coventry he was doing work or Birmingham yeah. I'll definitely look him up. I'm really yeah. interested in um, how um, sort of the, I guess the fine line between between participation, as you've just described it, and voyeurism. Yeah. Um, and perhaps, perhaps you might say that uh, like a Martin Parr's view of working class identity might be slightly more voyeuristic, where yeah. someone like Chris Killip, who's a photographer who recently died, I'm a huge fan of, um, might be more participatory but where that line comes like how do you identify that where where is it collaboration and where is it more um voyeuristic i suppose but that sounds really interesting thank you i'll, I'll have a look at edgar's work yeah definitely yeah. and also like in the 30s they used to take a lot of photos in america and there is questions about those photos that mm -hmm. you know the people they took the photos of weren't participants they they were subjects Mm, subjects yeah that's, a, that's a, a good way of putting it yeah mm. someone's asked if we're on facebook we are on facebook um we have a, a fantastic digital manager uh, heather who uh, looks at all of our content on facebook um we're oh i think it's just arts council collection on facebook we're also on instagram and twitter um, and we have a mailing list um I'm going to put my email address in the chat here. So if anyone does want to get in touch about anything, definitely drop me a line. Beth is at the, yeah, that's right. Um, and I can also share the, I'm just going to have to quickly find it, but I'm, I can also share the mailing list for the Working Class British Art Network as well. But if anyone has any questions, please do get in touch. Um, it's always great to, 
to hear what's going on and you know if you've got any questions about the collection um i will do my best best to answer them um we'll just leave it a couple of just a few seconds just while beth puts a link to the mailing list in the chat and if anyone has any other questions um please feel free to ask them now if you would like to there we go so better put the link there in the chat um is that that's to sign up for the mailing list is for information on the that's working the, class. yeah that's the working class british art mailing list um and i know to sign up to the arts council collection mailing list is on our website so i'll post our website in there um and there's a link to it there so the Working Class British Art Network is slightly separate. For, we're a part, we're partner between Museum as Muck and Arts Council collection, but because of it has to show independent research, so it is slightly independent from Central Arts Council collection activity. Great. I'm just going to put, there we go. So this is this Arts Council Collections website, if anyone fancies, fancies a look. Perfect. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Beth for um, that really interesting presentation and to talk, for talking to us a bit about the Working Class Network as well, which I think is something that will be of huge interest to a lot of outside ins artists. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yep. And uh, if anyone is interested in joining that network, um, do sign up to the mailing list. Have a look at the Arts Council Collection website. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this lunchtime. It's been great to see you all. Yeah, seconded. It's really nice to have a chat, not be on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see some faces, isn't it? Yeah. Every now and then. <laughs> Definitely. Great. Well, enjoy the rest of your days, everybody, and um, hopefully see some of you soon. Take thank care. You. Very interesting. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Michelle.